Hello Unity fans, today we're resuming the process of getting our woodcutter to chop down and harvest trees. Given that we've already managed to get him to find a tree and walk up to it in our last video, this may seem straightforward. But there are a few things to consider in the bigger picture in order to let it all fit seamlessly into the system. These include his position on the terrain in between steps, possible interaction with objects and other units, and how much fine detail to focus on visually. Note that the first screen captures in this video still have the penguin-like walking animation in place. I corrected this only later, as described in the previous video, which you can find in the link in the upper right and down below. But let's get going with this one. When our woodcutter has found his target, we subtract a buffer from the tree's position in the direction of the hex the woodcutter would approach from, so that he doesn't walk to right on top of the tree, but have some space to swing his arms. We make this a parameter so that we can adjust it in one place should any of the dimensions or scales change. So we can set up different locations on the target hex for the unit to walk to, instead of the middle of the hex each time and the gradual start and stop functionality still works. We see that the axe connects with the trunk of the tree no matter from which direction it was approached, so our offset is working nicely. But the hits are not yet registering, so the trees never fall over. In order to string all these actions and effects together in a sequence, we need a list of possible actions and effects, as well as some way to manage them and decide when which one should happen. As we did for the possible resource types in the previous video, we create another enum for the possible actions. For now, we'll only implement a few of them, and let's hope we don't have to get to the dying one soon. So we now store the previous and current actions to allow us to write some logic to determine the sequence of actions to take. On every frame, we test whether the unit is ready for orders. If he is, we let him select the next action to perform. If there was no previous action, so when the unit starts out, we let him search for a tree. After finding a tree, we let him travel to the tree and start chopping when he gets there. When he has chopped the tree down, he steps back from it to get out of the way, after which he searches for the next tree. We will add some more steps here later. Each time a new action is set, we back up the previous action and indicate that the unit is not ready for orders anymore and that the current order has not completed successfully yet. Only once the current order has been completed do we move on to the next. But how do we know when an order has completed? We implement a system of sending instructions that should be executed once the action has been completed along with the call for action. These are incidentally also called actions, but they are Unity's formal actions. So we see, once a resource has been found, whatever action was passed along will be executed at this point in the algorithm. In this case, the action we want to be performed is merely setting the flags to indicate that the current action has been completed successfully. Since the last order has been successfully completed, a new order will be selected based on the previous order. So the current action will become to travel to the resource which will be called again with an action of setting the complete and success flags when done, so that chopping can commence. Here you can see this sequence of actions playing out, as well as the woodcutter walking back to the previous hex when the tree has been chopped, before repeating the cycle. Here we have linked the chopping animation purely to a certain amount of time, so you'll see some wild final swings with the axe while he's turning around. To keep everyone from getting hurt, we'll have to align the animation with when the chopping is actually done. But how do we know when the chopping is actually complete? This is a bit more complex. Remember that we've set a certain number of hits required before a tree is considered successfully chopped down. We need a mechanism to count the hits administered. For that, we turn to the animation itself. As soon as the axe is at the hitting point, we want to call a function that handles the chop. So we create an event at that point in the animation, and this event handles the chopping at precisely the right time. There is some code here which we'll get to a bit later, but for now just focus on the part that applies the hit, then tests whether enough hits have been administered, and if so, 
removing the resource from that location on the hex and cancelling the chopping animation. The application of the hit is handled in the resources script so that it can later be applied to all resources. All it does is it reduces the hits to go, making sure it does not try to go below zero, in which case it would loop around to 255 again since it's of type byte. Finally, we set the action as successfully completed after a delay of a quarter of a second, which is the time required to smoothly fade from the chop animation to the idle animation before starting the walking animation. The final step of the cycle is stepping back from the falling tree. We've let him step back all the way to the previous hex before, but this leads to problems. For one, when one unit has stepped back onto a hex, another won't be allowed to also use that hex in its path. However, these two units may have come from the same hex at different times, and would want to return to the same hex. The first one would claim the hex, and the second one would not know what to do, since there would be no way back. You can see this happening to this woodcutter hiding behind this tree here. The hex to his north was occupied by the other woodcutter when he needed to step back, and now his action could not be completed successfully, causing his action sequence to be disrupted. It would be better to keep a unit confined to the hex he's working on. So we only let him walk back to the edge between the two hexes. Since we carefully control the direction in which our tree falls, which we'll get to later, we don't need a lot of space to get the woodcutter safely out of the way. So moving back to the edge works fine for any of the possible tree locations. In this zoomed in view, you will notice two additional minor visual details along with the more noticeable falling tree. The tree shivers slightly every time the axe hits it, and trees sway to and fro in the breeze. We achieve these two effects using the same mechanic at different intensities, namely rotating the tree slightly over time, which I've implemented in a script called Shiver Me Timbers. To allow us to implement this, we take as input the time the movement should take, as well as the direction, which actually includes the size of the movement as the magnitude of the direction vector. The range of time one new swaying motion should take is also an input. A random duration between the from and to values is selected. Next, we need to know whether the movement has already begun, whether the tree is currently allowed to sway, and whether the tree is being chopped at the moment. This is important since you want to stop the tree from swaying when it is in the process of being chopped, so you can rather apply the shiver movement to it. Since we will also force the direction the tree falls to, we don't want it to be bent over towards the opposite side and then jerk it back into the direction we want it to fall. This would defy the laws of physics and look unnatural. So we force it to be upright while it gets chopped, except for the shivers when the axe hits but, when it is shivering or swaying, we make sure the rotation happens in both directions, so the tree ends up very close to its original rotation again. We actually save the original rotation before we start, and force the tree back to it at the end of the movement, so that small differences in frame rate don't cause misalignment over time. We use the smooth step function to ensure a smooth natural start, direction change and end to the movement. By centering the movement time around the halfway mark and dividing by half the time, our effective timestamp moves from negative 1 to positive 1, which covers the two directions in one expression. Getting the tree to fall over realistically is a bit more complex, so we will cover that in a future video. We will also consider more interaction with the tree in the form of logs. We will also cater for the functionality of trees that start as saplings and grow into large trees over time. This can be used to naturally replenish woods so they don't disappear completely over time, and bring with it further considerations and limitations to keep in mind. Please stay tuned to the channel for more. Goodbye.